I can tell you if you want how HSBC trades. Go on. Yeah. Yeah. So everyone always says if you trade like the banks, right? Yes, and you probably see that quite often. Doesn't work. So what is the reality of the banks trading? So I will tell you. Number one. Welcome everyone back to the Words of Wisdom podcast. We are back once again, the fastest growing podcast in the trading space. I would say the best, but I'm a little bit biased, but that's thanks to all of you and our incredible guests. We very recently went over 150,000 subscribers, which is absolutely insane because about a year ago we were on 5,000. And that, again, it's thanks to all of you and our incredible guests. Talking of which, we are joined by the one and only Mark Fraser. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. And you are from Beaumont, Outlooks. Yeah. I nearly said something else. <laughs> <laughs> we got it. Um, but let's get straight into it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's keep it. I want to say keep it brief, but we'll go straight into it in terms of your journey. Cool. So how long have you been trading for? So I started trading in 2018. So at the end of my first year of uni. Uh went through a multitude of different strategies, different companies, uh, and then started my own firm in COVID. Because obviously at the time I didn't really have nothing to, else to do. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then obviously I started my other company as well with Drew, of course. Uh, and then we are also launching a new business this Thursday. So it's exciting stuff. Incredible. Well, yeah, this will be dropping on Thursday, to be fair, which is good timing, I guess. Yeah. That was a good timing. What is it that's uh, that's dropping? So for those who might know, uh, Zane, I obviously taught Zane or ZM Capital, as some people know him as. Mm -hmm. Taught him in FHC during COVID. To be fair to you, he was already, a lot of people are like, oh, like, you've done really well, Zane. Like, he was already a good trader beforehand. I uh, just needed a bit of tweaking, that's all. Uh, so essentially what we're doing is we're getting all of his content, all of our content. So obviously Zane's more lower time frame technical, mm -hmm. um, SMC. We're, we do supply and demand in terms of technicals, but we're more fundamentals. So we'll go behind why the markets are driving, why they're going up, why they're going down, why they're going sideways. Uh, and then, of course, we've got another branch of that business as well with Kareem FX. So some people may, may know him as well. Uh, he'll be doing more of the US 30 because uh, he's very much equity based. And then we've got Zahab and he does more of the Wyckoff and a bit of fundamentals as well. So it's quite, quite exciting. So nice, diverse yeah. range. Yeah. Uh, incredible. That sounds really good. And yes, yeah, ZM, I, I, I remember, sorry, when he came for his podcast episode, which was roughly about a year ago as well. Um, you know, he mentioned obviously being a student of yours. Mm -hmm. A good friend of mine is also has been a student of yours as well, or still yeah. is. I don't know how it works. <laughs> um, but they've both spoke very, very highly of your work. Um, and the funny thing is actually my friend, who's a close friend of mine, he had mentioned you years ago, you know, years ago. And he kept saying like, oh, you should look into this guy, you know, in terms mm -hmm. of uh, fundamentals. And uh, unfortunately, me being the procrastinator that I am when it comes <laughs> to fundamentals. Um, and I think the majority of people are. And that's quite why a common so, theme, to be fair to you. Exactly, it's yeah. quite a common theme. And that's why I was so excited to have you on, mm -hmm. because I feel like, especially since COVID in particular, but it's always been the case in terms of how important fundamentals are. But since COVID, I'd say it's been slightly heightened. And what do you think to that statement? I agree with that. That's when I got into fundamentals, actually, because before that, I was always taught that fundamentals isn't important. How I was actually taught was you look at Forex Factory, you look at the red folder news. Oh, don't trade that because it's CPI or oh, CPI is coming hotter by the dollar or something, which that just does not not the case. Mm -hmm. Uh, but yeah, I got into it during COVID because like you mentioned, it's very heightened. Um, everyone was talking about, you know, the inflation. Everyone's talking about cutting rates. And then we got into sort of 2022 when everyone's talking about hiking rates. So yeah, it's definitely it's on the come up, I think, through a lot of retail traders as well, which is nice to see. Definitely. I bet it is nice to see as well. Yeah, I'm sure. Do you feel like fundamentals is a necessary component? Mm -hmm. Because it's, otherwise you're kind of trading blind or half like with one eye open rather than both. I agree with that. So a lot of the traders that we speak to, so we get like, we speak to a lot of traders at the banks uh, and institutions. They always mention about how fundamentals drives price. Mm -hmm. So fundamentals gives you the direction. Technicals gives you the entry and the risk. So the way I like to sort of phrase it is technicals is a reflection of what's happened fundamentally already. Mm -hmm. So that's why there's a reason why euro dollar would fall from 110 all the way, and all the way down to 105. There's a reason for that. So if you understand that reason, you're able to capitalize on that because it also adds probabilities as well. Trading's all about probabilities. Mm -hmm. So if you can increase your probability, even by 1%, I think that's good value as well. Definitely. Let me ask you an interesting question that I'm sure most people have asked themselves as a trader. Mm -hmm. Should you trade the news? And when I say that though, I mean the actual news itself. So CPI is okay. coming out, let's say 130. 
It's 115. There's a trade entry right there. Should I trade it at that time? So trading the actual news release. Um, banks do it, uh, but that's because they know how to do it. So the issue nowadays is obviously a lot of people don't know about what what the date, if a date comes out, what does it actually mean for the market? Yeah. So the bank would know, okay, if it comes in at our forecast, let's say CPI is going to come in a little bit hotter because of rent, for example, that would allow then a bit more of a hawkish Fed and then, you know, a potential uh, rate hike and that drives the dollar high. So the markets would, or the banks would trade into that. But the issue for a lot of sort of traders is they don't understand the reason why. So they get caught wrong footed and then they start blaming the banks when in reality, it's just, you just didn't understand the, the trade. So if you're new, uh, no, of course not. Uh, but once you start to get into the swing of things, I think it's definitely something you can capitalize on. You do have to keep your risk management very, very, very key. That, talking of which, that's that going to be my follow-up question to that is a lot of traders nowadays, I say a lot, mm-hmm. I think it's because a lot of traders maybe in the community that we see on say Twitter or yep. or X now, I always <laughs> forget, I always forget it's changed, but X now, um, or Instagram is a, a lot of SMC, a lot of uh, ICT. And with a lot of that, and it's not to say those concepts are predominantly scalpers, for example, but I feel like a lot of people find themselves scalping mm-hmm. uh, out of choice rather than like that's what's promoted. Um, but they choose to be scalpers, which is no problem. But the problem with scalping and then the news element is that you're using very tight stops, mm-hmm. right? And even if you're risking 1% with tight stops, the volatility of news, how does that recipe look to you or in your eyes? Uh, it It creates a toxic slew of potential slippage so obviously, if something comes in really bad, like if the markets aren't priced for that event, that's what creates those wild swings that you see. Mm-hmm. So you run the risk of obviously getting slipped out uh, for your broker. If you have a good broker, hopefully it doesn't happen, uh, but there's always that risk. So yeah, I I always, if I am ever going to, I don't very often trade the news, mm-hmm. uh, but if I am, it would always be very, very low risk. So like a 0.5%, which is hardly anything. Yeah. And what, what sort of stop losses are you using? Because your style of trading okay. is quite swing some may even say position to a point because of the length of time that you're holding your positions Mm -hmm. so what sort of stop loss sizes are you using then uh it varies on on pairs because obviously you if you trade like euro gbp for example it's quite low volatility you know you can have quite relatively tight stop Uh, if you trade gold you tend to have a bit of a wider stop because the volatility is much higher Mm -hmm. so you do have to count over volatility when you are entering the market so there's something called atr or average true range so what that basically means is it's statistics. You can go and do it yourself in like Excel or whatever sort of website, but you, based on previous sort of elements of way the market has moved, euro dollar moves, let's say 0.5% up or down in a day, for example. I don't know the actual figure off the top of my head right now, but it will, it will say every day on, on average over the past 30 years, euro dollar has moved 0.5% higher or 0.5% lower. So you, you then do also have to incorporate that into your stop. So you can't argue having like a 0.1% move from euro dollar mm-hmm. if the stats state that it will move either up or down 0.5% mm-hmm. in a move. So you do have to counter that. Uh, but also I tend to just place it below or above major structure highs. So I would tend to have anything where between 30 plus pips on a stop. But my target's five, six, seven, 800 pips away. I've exactly. Had, yeah, I've, I've, I've had... Even trades go to 2,000 pips. Obviously, I don't hold all of the volume. Of course. uh, Because obviously partials and and risk management. Uh, But yeah, my risk reward is still pretty decent because obviously I'm swinging it for for such a long time. So, How how have you developed that patience? Was was that always your style? Were you scalping or day trading before adopting to that? Yeah, I was, yeah. So that's how I was taught anyway is intraday, sort of intraweekly, I'd say I was more like. I'd hold it for a couple of days and then exit. Uh, until I realized that actually I prefer to to understand the reason why. So I did that sort of pre-COVID anyway. That was sort of my strategy until I actually understood or started to understand why the markets move. And that was the fundamentals. And I realized that actually, you know what, I probably need to run with, my, run with the guns, right? So I need to say, okay, I see your dollar falling. This is this because the ECB is doing this, the Fed's doing this, something's happening in China. That's bad for Europe, for example. That then allows your dollar to fall 300 pips to the downside. And then I just naturally just developed into it. I think it's personal as well. So for yourself, let me ask you, do you see yourself sort of, do you swing trade or are you more intra? Funnily enough, I recently switched to sort of trying to swing trade. So far, it's been more intra-week. Mm-hmm. Like I've held a couple of positions over a weekend, but it's mm-hmm. not been 
swing trading to the degree of, say, more than a week so far. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to develop that because I've been scalping for the last three, four years. Mm -hmm. So you know, it's quite ingrained, you know, that sort of lack of patience. I feel I have the patience. It's just that I haven't analyzed something yet with a long-term target to hold or try okay. to hold that target. Um, but yes, yes. So I've just transitioned to swing trading. So I'm trying to build the patience or at least find the analysis. I don't have that clarity just yet on a higher time frame perspective. And I don't have the understanding of fundamentals either um, yeah. to sort of aid that. So I don't have like a bigger picture play I'm trying to trade at the moment. Because um, the markets in January actually been very interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, they've yeah. been a lot of the pairs that I've been looking at are all sort of sideways. Yeah. Plus as a scalper, I was only trading EU. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I not, haven't sat. Yeah, 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 it's, it's been much. It's been a it's been an interesting time, but that's one thing as a swing trader. I'm trying to get used to of looking at other pairs and actively trading other pairs mm -hmm. because I can now. Yeah. Um, I just haven't yet. I've literally um, I changed in like November mm -hmm. to sort of swing trading, and therefore since then maybe a handful of trades on EU as you can imagine like yeah. December was quite nice we had some mm -hmm. decent movements that was quick but then January yeah January we just completely have crunched down into a range which is no problem like I expect uh, we will expand at some point maybe this week obviously with yeah. the the Fed this week NFP this week um, that's my hope <laughs> that's my hope anyway yeah so the markets would use the data as a catalyst because they always need a catalyst to move the market. Mm -hmm. So they'll wait for, that's why the markets have consolidated is because they're unsure of what could happen. People have their views, like for example, HSBC are massively bullish dollar this year, whereas Goldman Sachs and BMU Power are, are massively bearish. So they have their own views. So what they'll wait for is the data to confirm that view and then they'll run with that. So for example, if this week uh, the Fed reinforces that the Fed isn't going to cut anytime soon, the dollar will rally because there's a lot of cuts priced in. So cutting rates is obviously bad for the currency. Okay. So if those get pushed back, 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 all, all the way into the year. So at the moment, markets expect May. If they get pushed back to June and then July, that pushback is what drives the dollar higher. Mm -hmm. But if the Fed reinforces those cuts this week, the dollar will sell off because it just allows markets to actually say, hey, you know what? We could probably price in a little bit more cuts because they're, a lot more dovish than we expected. Mm -hmm. So they need catalysts. The markets need catalysts. So why is that though? So when the interest rates are coming down, why is that bad for the currency? So it's bad for the currency for a couple of reasons. Number one, in terms of the dollar, so because, you know, dollar drives everything, right? So when the markets are cutting rates or the Fed, for example, what that creates is it, it becomes a little bit cheaper to borrow money. And equity is, or at the equity markets are propped up on debt. So as it becomes cheaper, people buy more into to equities. That's why it's known as sort of that risk on. And that drives the dollar lower because they're pumping money out. They're pulling money out of the dollar and putting it into riskier assets to gain yield. So that pull out, pushing into Australian dollar. That's why in, if you're looking at December's price action, when the dollar sold off massively, because obviously the Fed was pretty dovish, Aussie dollar rallied extremely aggressively. Uh, and that's because it allowed the markets to think, ah, it's actually good for risk, good for risk appetite, bad for the dollar. Dollar is seen as that safe haven. Mm -hmm. That's why during COVID it pumped really aggressively. Um, and they'll think, okay, who is extremely undervalued? Uh, and then they'll go to Australian dollar. So I can tell you if you want how HSBC trades. You want? Yeah. Yeah. Well, so everyone always says, yeah, we trade like the banks, right? Yeah, so and you probably see that quite doesn't, often. Doesn't matter. So what like is the that. reality of the banks trading? So I'll tell you. Number one, the lowest prices in the entire industry with challenges from just $35 and payouts in as little as five days. The expert challenge is finally here. Get funded up to $100,000 at skilled funded traders. With unlimited trading days and 85% profit split, the expert challenge changes the game. Click the link below to get started today. You have to understand why people say that. The issue for, for a lot of people is market makers aren't out to get you because number one, they need to make sure the markets are working in a good function. Mm -hmm. They're not out to manipulate you. They're not out to take your stops out. They make money elsewhere in the bank, right? Because the, the way that market makers make money is they get it off the bid-ask spread. So, or I can't remember the actual phrasing there, but they make the money off the spread. Yeah. Um, two, they're regulated. So like the FCA or the SEC will regulate that market maker to say, you're not going to man manipulate the market. You're not going to do this. You're not going to do that. So to me, I don't understand how people can argue that the market makers are out to get you. 
it's a marketplace at the end of the day, right? They're buying and selling orders constantly. Mm -hmm. So the issue is, is that the markets would see the data and say, oh, it's going to trend lower, trend lower. People will be buying it because it's hitting a demand candle or, or support level. But the fundamentals are telling it is to go lower. So the market makers have to allow that to happen. So they'll have to fill the orders, of course. But funnily enough, it will push to a level where a lot of people stop. So, and that's where well, they'll blame the banks to take you out. So, yeah, I just wanted to get that clarified for, for a lot of people. I know that's quite a common question uh, on how they do it. So, yeah, they're not, they're not out to get you. Uh, it's just the functions on the market. Yeah. Uh, and now, in terms of how HSBC trades, so they have five rules that they look for when they enter a trade. Number one, they look at carry. So a carry trade is essentially, have you ever looked on like your MetaTrader and you see swaps? Yeah. That's essentially what it is. So it's the interest rate differential. So it's the difference between two ec economic interest rates. So number one, if you are selling USDJPY, you're going to get negative because what you're doing is you're selling yen, buying into the dollar. So mm -hmm. Japan, negative 0.1% interest rates. So you're borrowing it really cheap to then push it into the dollar. But if you're selling it, you're automatically saying you're borrowing dollars, pushing it into yen because you're selling dollar, buying yen. Yeah. And then that changes, you're getting negative, aren't you? So that's why you get negative swaps. So what they'll do is they'll buy the highest yielding economy. So they will buy who has the highest interest rates, who has the highest bonds, basically the bond yields. The US tends to be quite a good performer there. Australia, Canada, Eurosin is the funder, so the other side of the coin. Uh, Swissy and the yen are also seen as funders as mm. well. So they're sold, that's why they are sold the most. So they'll look to buy the most uh, highest yielding currency versus the lowest yielding. That's why if you look at USDJPY during 2022, it rose massively because the markets were buying USD, of course, because one really hawkish. Bank of Japan was super dovish. Then that allowed to one, get carry. So they're making money on the trade without even the price moving. Mm -hmm. And two, they're obviously making money because the Fed was pretty hawkish. Yeah. So that they will make money on the actual price movement as well. Number two, what they'll then look at is uh, monetary policy trajectory. So monetary policy trajectory is who's expected to be the most hawkish. You want to buy that currency. Who's expected to be the dovish. You want to sell that currency. So that's why... For example, in December, we'll pretend back December because that was a really nice price action. The Fed was super dovish or was expected to be really dovish based on what they said. Mm. Dollar got sold off massively. But at the time, the ECB weren't as dovish. So that allowed Euro dollar to climb really aggressively, mm -hmm. similar to GU as well. Um, they'll then also look at moving averages. So people will laugh at that. I know that. But moving averages is just a confirmation to get in. They'll look at that on a daily time frame. I believe it's, I believe it's the four... Uh, and 40 uh, day moving average. Mm -hmm. They'll then also look at the, let me think off the top of my head, the most undervalued. So they'll buy the most undervalued currency on a 60 day look back period. So they'll look at the last 60 day price action and say, who's been sold the most, let's buy that. Mm -hmm. And then who's been bought the most, let's sell it. So you can all you're doing is just looking for a divergence. So who's yeah. really been bought, who's really been sold, do the opposite. That's based on, of course, HSBC. Uh, and then the last rule, so number five is they look at valuation models. So a valuation model that is quite commonly used in a lot of banks is called REER. So Real Effective Exchange Rate or REER. So what they will do is do that model, which uses um, price, or the actual price action they will use is uh, interest rates as well to determine on a period, is the currency extremely overvalued relative to the model? Or is it extremely undervalued? And then they'll look to buy and obviously sell, buy the most undervalued, sell the most uh, overvalued. So that's what they do when they they look to trade. They'll look at all these rules and say, okay, which is the most, which one is fitting the best? Yeah. But then they'll also look at like the data, the CPI to just add to that narrative. So Definitely. That's how they do it. How do you know that? Because I've got the rules. I can I can show you the screenshot. Really? <laughs> where, did, where did you get it from? Uh, so we we know somebody who works at HSBC. Uh, he obviously gives us a lot of the um, a lot of their, their research documents, a lot of their trade ideas as well. We can get access to that, which seems pretty crazy. And a lot of the theme we've noticed is the technical analysis is so minor relative to the reasoning. So that even from a logical perspective, surely there's more to trading than just looking at a couple of lines, right? And I know a lot of people talk about there's an algo to the market. I disagree. Reason for that is one, let's just use logic. If there was an algo to the market, why is the hit rate still the same? Why are there still the same amount of people losing money? If there was an algo that people have solved, 
surely there would be more people winning. Mm -hmm. Would you agree? I would agree, yeah. Would you say, though, that in terms of algorithms, I know there's like a narrative that uh, among some communities that there's an overlord algorithm, if that makes sense, like mm -hmm. one algorithm that's like a master algorithm. Yeah. Would you say, however, there are algos that are being used in the market? Yeah, yeah, like higher uh, high frequency trading mm -hmm. algos, but they they don't use like RSIs and MACDs for how sort of MetaTrader um, algos do it. They'll use uh, FX vol, so FX volatility. So they'll look at alpha, they'll look at beta, they'll mm -hmm. look at gamma on, that's like really, I don't understand that much, to be honest yeah. with you, because I'm not like really into that maths, but a lot of people who are watching this will understand the maths behind that. Uh, and then they'll look at that and the discrepancies. And that's what the high frequency is doing, is just profiting off the Very minute yeah. numbers. Yeah, yeah. No, definitely. And uh, let's go into like a fundamentals masterclass, if you will, or, or fundamentals for dummies like yeah. me, you know, <laughs> and that hopefully some other people can join me as well back home. But you mentioned hawkish and dovish. Mm -hmm. Can you break down those terms for us? Yeah, so it's obviously a common, very a very common um, phrase that's that's said in the market. Mm. Hawkish is essentially: is the central bank expected to raise rates? So that's hawkish. Is inflation trending up? You'd expect the central bank to be hawkish. That's why, from a reaction function, so the reaction of the market tells you everything. So when CPR comes in hotter, the that's what the market rallies or tends to rally majority of the time because the central bank is then expected to be hawkish because they need to raise rates to battle inflation. That's the main tool that they use to battle mm. it. So essentially, what is there's, are they suggesting that rates are going to be higher? That's it. Um, so are interest rates expected to be higher? Are they expecting to hold it higher for longer? Which is a very common theme, especially now, because no central bank is expected to hike again. The next, the next question is, when are they going to cut? So that was mm. what we was talking about earlier about if that Fed this week pushes back on those rate cuts, that's them being hawkish. Mm -hmm. uh, because they're saying we're not going to be dovish by cutting rates. Yeah, we're we're going to keep pay our high, uh, rates high for longer, as high as we could possibly, mm -hmm. to bring inflation lower. So on the flip side of that, dovish would mean the opposite. Yeah, they're just and simply cutting rates. So we have FOMC is it tomorrow evening? Today's Tuesday. Yes. Yeah, I believe it is. Yeah. Testing it. Out. <laughs> <laughs> I think it is. Yes. Yeah. Normal seven p.m. for the UK. Um, and therefore, if they were to sit there and say, okay, we're looking to cut rates soon. Would you know how would that impact the market as an example? You would see the dollar sell off very drastically. So the reason why the dollar has rallied so aggressively this this month since the start of January is number one, let's tail back to HSBC's trading rules. That was sold the most in in that period. So you would say, okay, dollar's been sold the most. Let's buy it. So it's actually more prone to upside than downside at that moment. Mm. But then also we had sort of data was actually relatively decent in the US that allowed the Fed or allowed the markets to push back on those rate cuts. Mm -hmm. So that pushback gave that dollar the boost. What you got to think is, why is the markets move lower? Why is the markets move higher? And just think the opposite. So the markets move higher because number one, the data was pretty good. Inflation's slightly stickier. PMIs were pretty good. So PMI data, retail sales was all right. Uh, wages was slightly sticky. So obviously if you get paid more, you tend to spend more. That creates inflation. Mm -hmm. That's why the markets move. Um, that allowed the markets to price back um, or push back cuts. That gave the dollar the boost. So if the Fed actually says we're going to cut rates, that's completely opposite to what the market, why the markets drove higher. Mm -hmm. So that then gives them a reason to sell off. So that's what would happen is if they do reinforce that, uh, then they won't necessarily say, yeah, you're, we're not going to cut rates anytime soon, or they won't say it directly. But yeah. if the markets will, that's why you have jobs in the banks known as Fed watchers. Mm -hmm. So they look at the, the minute discrepancies between what was said last meeting relative to this meeting. Yeah. And that then says, oh, they were really dovish this meeting. Oh, they're really hawkish this meeting or wasn't really said much. That's what I was going to ask you then. So like going into an event like this mm -hmm. it is quite a catalyst yeah. and it's a reoccurring theme. So sometimes I remember when I first started trading, NFP was like a huge mover. That was a mm -hmm. massive thing. Like you would see a wick one side for like 10, 20 pips and then go the other way and then maybe come back wherever it may be. Nowadays, I'd say NFPs kind of calmed down a yeah, little has, bit, yeah. right? CPI seems to be the one driving that, or at least over the last uh, year and a half, two years. Mm -hmm. um, but then FOMC, ECB, et cetera, that's always, always, yeah. that doesn't change. So coming into that then, are there little things that you can track as a trader to help you with these events, right? And to be on the right side of it, or at least analyze correctly. Are you talking about in terms of... Like so, FOMC, ECB, so like... What would you look at in terms Would you look of the, at? So rather than not okay. just looking at, say, the release and the maybe the press conference afterwards, and maybe you can touch on how important those press conferences are to mm -hmm. understand and, and to listen to, uh, but are there other things 
beforehand that a trader can look at and say, okay, this information, if I look at this information and I can dissect this information, it's actually helpful going into this meeting. Yeah, so you can do a lot of backtesting. You can do, not in terms of looking at charts, mm -hmm. just look at like sort of previous meetings, what's happened, but look at the data. The data will tell you what's going to happen with the Fed. Mm -hmm. That's why the markets are leaning into a little bit of a hawkish Fed is because we had a little bit of a wage growth was a little bit sticky. Our retail sales are not bad. Uh, CPI was pretty decent. Uh, and now the markets are leaning into a bit more of a hawkish Fed. So what you'll do is just watch the data. So go out and research, um, or you can ask, ask myself if you want to, but go out and research why would a central bank be hawkish, or why would they be dovish, or why would they raise rates, why would they not raise rates, why would they cut rates? They'll look at the data, you look at the data and say, okay, since the last fe Fed meeting to this meeting, what data has changed? Mm. So you'd say, okay, since the last meeting in December to, to this meeting, what has changed in terms of data? Has inflation come in stickier? Has wage growth come in a, a bit stickier as well? Has retail sales gone in, come in good? Has NFP been pretty good? Has the unemployment rate been good? And that would allow you to have an understanding of, okay, the Fed's a little bit more hawkish and that drives the price beforehand. So if you can identify that change, that allows you to understand what the Fed is going to do or what the ECB or what the Bank of England, it's all exactly the same. You're mm -hmm. doing exactly the same thing for Fed, exactly the same thing for the ECB, the Bank of England, and then that gives you understanding on which currency to buy and sell. So watch the data beforehand, and that will give you an idea of what the central bank will likely do at this meeting. Perfect. And what would you say in terms of the go-to data every trader should know? Which What would you say that is? CPI, so obviously inflation. PPI, which is obviously just the producer prices. Uh, GDP, wage growth, uh, retail sales, unemployment rate, PMI data. That's what I'd say, personally. It's not a crazy list. No, it's not. All you're doing is just understanding what has the change been since the last print, yep. and what does that change mean? That's mm -hmm. the most important thing. What does this data actually mean? I know mean? a lot of people will look at, as you said earlier, red folder news, and then they'll see, oh, it's green, so it's come out better. But they don't actually understand, and but then the markets do the opposite, mm -hmm. and they don't understand. Oh, it's not green, but that. it's like it's gone higher than the previous one. They may think that's good. This is higher, mm -hmm. but they don't actually understand what it represents, as you said. Yeah. Um. And so then they get very confused. Like, oh, why has the price gone the other way though? Yeah. There's, it... there's this tends to be a reason for that. Mm -hmm. So, when you look at PMI data on your metric or your not metrader, your forex factory or train economics or whatever sort of website you want to use for your data or your news, mm -hmm. there's always underlying data. So services PMI is above 50 is good. Below 50 is, is not, it tends to be not great. But there's always underlying data to that. So there'll be prices component within PMI, there'll be, which is inflationary. There'll be employment component, which gives you an idea of what NFP could be. Well, this is what I want to ask you, actually. I think we can break it down maybe into a few steps mm -hmm. that will help a lot of people get some insights, yeah. which is those key data points that you mentioned. Like why don't we just break them down, if possible, break them down into just what they represent. So let, let's start with CPI being obviously a main one. What does CPI represent? How is that? Why is that number important? Yeah. Uh, what was that made uh, number made up of? Mm -hmm. well, maybe we can break them down for each of those key ones. Uh, and no doubt, a lot of people will hopefully be able to, including myself, <laughs> a bit <laughs> a bit selfish of me to ask, but um, <laughs> but uh, no doubt it will give people a lot of insight into what these things actually mean. Because I know a big part of the whole fundamentals thing is that people will just get put off by, and I, I'm one of them, of the terminology. You know, the lack of uh, understanding of what is CPI. Mm -hmm. you know? Um, you know, why is it important? What's it made of? Well, what yeah. is this number that comes out? What does that represent? Why do they then look at that number and then decide on interest rates? Mm -hmm. you know? um, so maybe we can go through each of those key good. points. That's a good, good, um, good question or a good sort of exercise. I just want to reiterate one thing and then that will allow you to understand 100%. what the, the other stuff is. There's two things. There's a good trader that we know. He's ex-futures trader. He's worked at a multitude of different institutions. He said a very good phrase that stuck with me for the past, what, year and a bit? There's tradable macro and there's macro. So the reason why a lot of, including myself when I started, I was really worried about the fundamentals because there's so much to learn. I have mm. to learn about trade balances. I have to learn about what's happening in China. To, there's so much, trust me. Uh, I was really overwhelmed. But then this, this phrase stuck with me is macro is everything added together, CPI, macroeconomics, trade balances, China, everything, models, everything. And then that gives a potential view of what could happen. Mm -hmm. Traders are going to look at it and say, it doesn't mean anything. Then it leads on to tradable macro, which is what does the market care about? 
So that leads us on to what you said before about NFP, why the markets have moved much in terms of NFP, because it doesn't really move the needle much for the Fed. and doesn't really mean or it doesn't really move the needle, needle much for what the Bank of England is going to do. So the markets will look at certain bits of data and say, OK, why the, the theme of the market, there's always a theme. So what is everyone talking about? Everyone's talking about cutting rates next. So now what you do is, OK, the, market, the theme of the market is what everyone's talking about. They're all talking about cutting rates. All we're doing is following data that will support that idea. So we then is follow data that would allow the Fed to cut or to raise rates. So in this instance, it's cutting. You'll follow data. So you'll follow the retail sales. You'll follow CPI. Forget about trade balances. Don't look at that. Uh, all you're doing is just following specific points. And then it crunches it down to such a small portion of data, it becomes a lot more digestible. So that's that's something I just wanted to reiterate because it's quite a good good little analogy and it's I think it's important. Yeah, it's definitely a um a thing I've I've definitely taken note of. So yeah, in terms of CPI, so consumer price index. So it's essentially just the price of goods or the change of price of goods from the last print. So on a month over month perspective, has inflation coming a little bit higher or is it coming lower from a year over year perspective? Has it coming higher? Is it coming lower? Then there's subcomponents of that. I can't remember all of them off the top of my head, mm -hmm. but there's all subcomponents, food, alcohol, um, rents, housing, services. And all you're doing, similar to what I was mentioning earlier about the theme, is just following the data that supports the idea of what the Fed is looking at. So then you look at what the Fed is saying, oh, they always mention housing. There's a housing component within CPI. Watch the housing CPI or the component within CPI. They always talk about rents. Well, there's a rent component within CPI. Just follow the rents. Forget about everything else. Yeah. Follow what the Fed is telling you, and that will allow you to cut out all the, the noise mm -hmm. and focus on what's... That important. goes back to what you were saying about what's tradable versus yeah. just being a part of it. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that's essential what CPI. It's just the price of goods, the change in price of goods. So the goods, it all sort of... Um, think as obviously we're in the UK. Freddo's. So, you know, those little chocolate frogs. Yeah. <laughs> they used to be super cheap when I was younger. Yeah, they were like 5p. Mm -hmm. Now they're like, what, 40, 50, 60p? Yeah. So that's an example of inflation. Um, it's just a, simply just the price uh, change in price of goods mm -hmm. and services. And what about uh, PPI? PPI is similar to CPI. So consumer price index, producer price index is PPI. Okay. It's essentially what's the inflation that the producers are feeling. Now that leads yeah. us onto what CPI can do because if the producers are feeling more inflation, they're not going to eat it up in their margins. They're going to pass it onto the consumer. Mm. And that's why you see a, a rise in price of goods in the shops, Asda or whatever sort of shop you go to. And that creates that inflation as well. Yeah. So if PPI is trending lower, which it is, if it comes in lower, you're exp then logically, if they're a good company, they would lower the price of goods relative to what inflation is doing. Yeah. So that's, it's just what the producers are feeling, essentially. Okay. And what about retail sales? Retail sales is, the clues in the name, how has people, what's this been spending like within the retail space? So how has spending been in John Lewis? What's it like in Argos? I don't think there's any Argos stores anymore, but what's it been like in Argos? And that just shows you how are the consumers spending? Mm -hmm. And there's a to do the different components within that, but all you're doing is just, I tend to just look at the main headline figure yeah. just to see kind of has people spent during that past period or have they not? Mm -hmm. And that gives you an idea of what inflation could be. Because mm -hmm. if people are spending, what do you think the company is going to do? They're going to raise prices. That creates that inflation. Okay. And then unemployment claims, obviously unemployment, yeah. uh, people claiming to be unemployed. Yeah. Why is that impacted? Then? Because or well, initial jobless claims, unemployment claims, they're pretty much near enough the same thing. Mm. But if people are claiming benefits, that tends to be for a reason. Maybe companies are laying off workers. So if people, are, if companies are laying off workers, that's a worrying, worrying sign, right? If you don't want people claiming benefits in your economy, you want them to be in jobs, you want them to you know, be part of the spending process. Yeah. So if people are now starting to claim benefits, then the market's think, oh, maybe loads of companies have laid off workers because you've got to remember people, um, they obviously use their, their, their salary to, to rent and stuff like that. If they come out of jobs, they're not going to sit there and like, okay, let me wait for me to get another job. They're going to claim benefits. So it just gives you an idea of how are, how's the company's sort of health in terms of their, uh, the, the claims or the, just trying to think of the, the correct phrase. <laughs> um, how is the consumer in terms of the jobs market? So yeah. it just gives you an idea of what the jobs market is like. Okay. And then 
Is there any others that we have? PPI? PPI, wage yeah. growth. That's yeah. a really, really important one. Uh, wage growth is simply, clues in the name, has people's wages growing? Mm -hmm. So if people's wages are growing from the previous month or previous, some people tend to look at a like three month or six month average just because it gives you a better Is that idea. a news release that comes out? Yes. What does it come under? Uh, it tends to be wage wage growth. I remember seeing that. Forex factories let me down. That's, <laughs> is that something yeah, that would come be, up on there? Yeah, yeah. It tends to be called wage growth, or it will tend to be called um, what's the other word? Can I look at my? Because I think there's <laughs> a G. <laughs> a G. I'm not remember, remember the. Because uh, I'm trying to think. I don't remember seeing that come up. Now I feel like I'm being cheated, even though I don't. <laughs> even though I don't understand all got, fundamentals, cause just because I don't know that definitely one. Definitely one this week for the US. I just can't remember the actual name. It tends to be named slightly differently, but on trade and economics, it's wage growth. Uh, it's not loading for me, the internet, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, yeah, true. Uh, but yeah, it's it's wage growth. On mm -hmm. Friday, it's released with NFP. So it'll be okay. unemployment rate, wage growth or wages, and then uh, um, unemployment rate, yeah, wages, and then NFP. Yeah. So it's always released with NFP. So just look at <laughs> the wage component within that. So essentially all it is is the change in the wages element. So if people are getting paid slightly more than they were previously, mm -hmm. what do you think happens in that environment? People now see a little increase boost to their salary. Naturally, people will raise their cost, their, their cost of living. And that raise initially is going to create inflation because people now start spending. Mm -hmm. And that tells back to CPI. People are spending, companies will raise prices, and that creates inflation. So if markets see wages coming hotter, they now think, oh, maybe inflation will come in a little bit hotter going forward because wage growth is a forward-looking indicator. So it tells you what could happen okay. in the future. And then that allows, then that brings the thought process. Oh, inflation may be up. Oh, that means, means hawkish central bank. Oh, that means stronger currency. Mm -hmm. So it's always a step process that they go through. Okay. Okay. That's very helpful. Was there any others? I think that was it. Wage growth, CPI, PPI, unemployment rate, just simply the, mm -hmm. the uh, people are unemployed. Um, NFP? P PMI. PMI as well. Yeah, yeah PMI. NFP is just non-farm payroll. So people who aren't in farm jobs, essentially. Um, PMI is Purchasing Managers Index. Mm -hmm. So that's a really, really important figure, especially for the UK, actually. Um, there's two subsections to an economy. There's services and there's manufacturing. So the UK, for example, is 75% services. So the markets do not care about what the manufacturing sector, because it hardly contributes anything to the GDP. Okay. which is the overall health of the um, economy. The markets will care then about services PMIs. So what it is is Purchasing Managers Index. It's essentially like a survey that's sent out to all the managers who purchase all the goods for the okay. company mm -hmm. and say, okay, how has have you seen a raise in prices? How's your employment within your company? How is Have you got any supply chain issues? How's the backlog of orders? Uh, and each, there's like five or six components within that that tells you each aspect of that services sector. Employment, prices, backlog of orders. I think there's a, a few others there, which markets don't really care. They care all, all about the employment and the prices component. Yeah. So if prices have risen, what do you think happens then? Potential inflation, mm -hmm. a bit more of a hawkish central bank, stronger currency. So that's why there's you always look at the under. So each of these well. elements, by the sounds of it, is like a, a knock-on effect yeah. when you understand it to then leading you straight back to the inflation and interest rate decision. Yeah. So there's three main data you always consider. Mm -hmm. Number one, GDP. So I mentioned that just very briefly, but gross domestic product, essentially just the overall health of the economy. Yeah. What they're spending, what they're receiving, everything. Then you obviously got inflation and then you've got interest rates. So obviously inflation and GDP is important and then interest rates is a component of what's happening with inflation. What you're doing is following those three and you need all the data adds to those three elements and then that gives you an idea of what the central bank is then going to do and then what the currency is likely to do if you minus out all of the risk on risk off events, of course. Definitely. Talking about those events, because we literally had something over the weekend, which I found interesting. Yeah. Um, potential US wanting to have some form of conflict mm -hmm. potentially in the Middle East. How do those events like war, right? We've obviously had Ukraine, Russia go ongoing now for quite some time. Um, this conflict in the Middle East with Palestine and, and Israel mm -hmm. is ongoing and, and could be expanding. These sort of events, how do they sort of get a reaction in the market? How does that impact the dollar, for example? Good, good question. So let's take a break for a minute there, guys, because I want to tell you about the best trading tool on the market, TradeZella. The reason why TradeZella is the number one trading tool that every trader needs is because you can do backtesting, automated journaling, 
trade replay, in-depth analytics, and so much more. And the greatest part about TradeZeller is that it's all automated. All you have to do is connect your MT4 and MT5. It will pull all your data onto the dashboard. You can add playbooks. You can just add notes. You can add images from your trades and you can get the insights that is necessary for you to progress as a trader. Now, TradeZeller is for absolutely everyone. Whether you're a crypto trader, whether you're a Forex trader, whether you trade prop firms, it is for absolutely everyone. And that is why thousands of traders have signed up using my link here through the podcast. Make sure you use the code RIZ10 for 10% off your monthly subscription or WOR for 20% off your yearly subscription. The link is in the description below. And let's get back to the episode. The dollar is seen as a safe haven currency. The reason for that is number one, the US is generally pretty strong in terms of political aspects. You know, they don't tend to have many issues. So from a, an investor perspective, they'll say, actually, the US is fairly safe. Number two, there's lots of dollars out there. There's so much supply of dollars out there that it's so super easy to buy and sell. So there's going to be zero issues with buying and selling. Uh, and then three, in times of unrest, they, the markets want to park their cash into something. So they'll park it into the most safest option. So which obviously allow just in terms of the buying selling aspect and of course the uh, the political aspect of the dollar mm -hmm. of the US that then equates into the US. So what they'll do is they'll buy, if you we're in the UK, we can't go to the US and buy the market with or buy into the US with pounds. Mm -hmm. You have to change your pounds into dollars and that switch. So you're technically selling GBP USD and that switch strengthens the dollar. So that aspect as well. So yeah, it's just simply the dollar is seen as a safe haven. So during yeah. COVID, for example, which is a massive news event or a massive risk event, dollar was massively bought. Mm -hmm. And then what they did is they saw that actually economically or, or pol and politically as well, actually at the time, the US was super bad in terms of their data and then they sold it off really aggressive. So you yeah. saw that initial pump and then it sold off extremely aggressively. So that's, again... It tends to be very short term mm -hmm. in terms of the way the dollar reacts. It tends to be roughly around a month. Uh, and then in terms of the Ukraine war, you do have to have an understanding of what happens within each aspect. Every aspect in terms of the war is different. For example, the war in, in, in the Middle East doesn't really impact gas prices much, but it does impact oil prices. Yeah. So you've got to think about the region. Russia exports a ton of gas yeah. and a ton of oil. So at the time, gas prices rose massively at the time because obviously they cut off Nord Stream 2, which yeah. tends to go through um, on the back right. I can't remember where. It goes through Turkey and then, then through. Mm -hmm. um, they cut off that, so the supply side is now psh, cut off. What do you think happens in that environment? What do you think? They have supplies, yeah, because yeah. they obviously need to, to raise Again. money. <laughs> yeah. So you're, you're getting that. Getting that. Uh, but yeah, essentially what it is is it, they cut off the supply aspect that rose the prices. Now you got to think from a FX perspective yeah. or training perspective, who imports the most gas? What do you think? Who do you think imports a lot of gas? Similar to oil, actually. Mm. Think about regional as well. Who's next? Regional, to yeah. Who's next to Ukraine? Ukraine. Who is next to Ukraine? Because my geography comes A bunch in. of different countries. I know that Germany's close by. Yeah. Um, France isn't there. Yeah, Europe. Europe. Europe, Europe, yeah. Europe, yeah. Europe, yeah. Europe, yeah. So trick question, man. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're so them. yeah, Europe. Euro sold off massively mm -hmm. because now their current account, which again is is um another aspect to trading, but their current account, which is an element of their spending, they've now gone into a massive deficit. Okay. So and then the euro sold off massively. Dollar in that environment rose because it's safe haven. Euro dollar shorts was very, very clean. Mm -hmm. And we sold it massively from at the top, actually. And it went all the way down below parity. So parity is just yes. one dot zero zero, yeah. essentially dead on one, went below that. And that's because it became a lot more issued. The economy was really weak. Inflation was rising massively because of that mm -hmm. aspect of gas uh, and from the current account and just regional as well. Then it leads us on to sort of the war in the Middle East. So similar framework is the region. Obviously, Middle East is very oil-based. Okay, well, if oil prices haven't risen much, there's a, for, there's reason for that because it hasn't disrupted supply yet. Mm -hmm. So yes, the war is happening but the markets are looking at the data and looking at sort of the, how long it takes to deliver those tankers. They're not seeing much supply issues. That's why oil prices haven't risen much. 
because the way they're doing it is obviously they don't go through the Suez Canal anymore. Yeah. They're going around the bottom of South Africa and then all the way to the left of Africa yeah. and going out. Because normally they go through Suez Canal, which obviously runs a little canal, yeah. runs through and then they go out through the Mediterranean. It's a much shorter route. Do you know oh. how I learned about that canal? How? A TV show called The Crown. About the is royal the, family. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah Imagine wife, that. My That's wife terrible. is actually watching it. I don't really watch hey. it. Hey. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't watch it. I'm sorry. I don't watch it. I feel like I got stabbed. <laughs> <laughs> I don't um, watch it. I don't watch it. No, but I, um, that's how I learned about it, which was so interesting. Because then now I heard, and then shortly after I watched that, and then saw this these issues that we're having, and now I understand. I'm like, yeah. wow. You know, then I can pretend like I know. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, it's essentially, yeah. obviously, the Suez Canal. There's a at, huge detour, though. It's huge. Yeah. But the way does they've seen that is it's not made too much of a difference to them. And that's why the oil price hasn't risen much. Um, so in that aspect, you now got to think, let's say there is a massive disruption now. Mm -hmm. Like, they, I don't know, they cut off all the ports, they start bombing ports and issues happen. Then, yes, you would see a massive rally in oil prices. Applying that to FX, because we're obviously FX traders, who imports the most oil? Europe, or mm -hmm. they import a lot of oil. Japan as well. Mm -hmm. Who exports a lot of oil? Who, so who's actually going to benefit? Sounds bad, of course. You don't really want to benefit from a war, but who benefits a lot from those higher prices? Canada, Norway, because they they export. Yeah. So now you got to think. Okay, from a trade idea perspective, Eurocad shorts makes a lot of sense because you've got massively importing Europe, massively exporting Canada. Pair them together. You want to be short Euro in that environment. Long Canada, Eurocad shorts makes sense. Then apply the same rep for Japan. Mm -hmm. From an initial perspective, you want to be selling the yen in that environment. Who exports a lot? Canada. Cad yen longs make sense. Not longs make sense because of that element of just comparing. Yeah. So in the, in big environments where there's massive risk off events, markets forget about the data economically. They look at the now. So they'll look at, oh, massive issues in oil. Okay, let's, let's short the euro. Let's long Canada. Let's long Norway. Let's short the yen. And in that environment, that's a trade idea. So you kind of forget about the data in that environment when it's massively in your face. Yeah. Um, and then again, from there, it's a trade idea. So it's pretty good. That's really good. No, the way the, that all piece together, you know, really, really, really makes sense. And I think uh, a lot of people are probably going to be sat there like this, <laughs> <laughs> uh, which is good, though, because that's the whole point of the podcast is really to get as much value and education and you know, yeah. gems, if you will, across. So the way I see it is that each podcast is like a book, you know, like, mm -hmm. you know, you, you might not get every single minute is going to completely blow your mind, you know, mm -hmm. but even if there's just five, 10 minutes that really changes your perspective, that's yeah. what it's all about. Don't get me wrong. It's really difficult. Like it's yeah. going to be really like, there's a lot of work, but think about it when you've done technicals. Yeah. It's really overwhelming at the start. The more you do it, the easier it becomes. I like to call it eureka moments. Like one day yeah. just, you wake up and it makes sense. Yeah. You got to do similar fundamentals that like there's a lot of things to consider. Don't mm -hmm. get me wrong. Uh, but you have to stay consistent. Consistency is key. And I think experience as well is the biggest lesson in trading as well i feel like that experience of going through these different data points you know, and as you said back test the data points yeah um and the, its reaction in the market so there are charts involved there mm -hmm. to see how it reacted yeah and then being able to carry that forward so it's the same process essentially mm -hmm. as the technical yeah right you have to learn about it learn the terminology learn about what each um aspect is how it how it impacts the markets thankfully again like this podcast i think has done well in terms of like uh, fundamentals for dummies, if you will. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and I'm sure there's more to go into, of course. But yes, like learn that, back test it, mm -hmm. right? See the, how it's performed in the past. Start to forward test. Start yep. to, when we say live test, essentially be there live to see the reactions, mm -hmm. etc. Collecting important. that data, um, and over time, obviously through that experience and, and that consistency, as you say, is yep. what then builds that confidence. I agree. So I don't think it's any different to the technicals. It's not. Um, if anything, I would say. Let's do technical side, because obviously there's learning technicals and there's trading technicals, right? I would say it's easier to learn the fundamentals, if anything, than it is to trade, right? Like yeah. you're learning terminology. Yeah. You're learning, um, you know, language, if you will. You're learning data points. Um, it's a still a strenuous process. So it's not like uh, you're going to learn it in a week, right? And you're going to understand it in a week. Yeah. What I mean is, in comparison to what everyone's trying to do anyway, and they're doing poorly for the most part, right? Mm -hmm. Most people are losing. Yeah. Surely it can't be that hard to learn fundamentals. Yeah, right. It's just, it's just uh, it takes a lot of work, mm -hmm. and a lot of people aren't willing to do that. Yeah. Now, don't get me wrong; it was really overwhelming when I started. I've done it during COVID, so it's kind of perfect because I had loads of time anyway. But it then got to a period where I was super overwhelmed with 
data and everything are kind of, you know, when you have kind of have that uh, mind blank. Yeah. Um, and then you just got to stick with it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then eventually it just clicks and then you start learning more and more and more. Like last year, I learned a lot with the bond market, which is really important in FX. Uh, equities as well. Not too dabbled too much into equities. Why would you say uh, the bond market is so important? Because I had someone on the podcast called Ali ICT. Um, and he's a big ICT guy. Mm -hmm. Believes in the algorithm. Yeah. Right? Interesting. Um, but he is one of the first people I ever spoke to who you know said he watches the bonds, he watches the equity, he watches the something else as well and, and as well as FX and so on and so on. he watches all these different things mm -hmm. and it's correlation and it's impact yeah he was the first person I ever heard talk about that uh, which was very interesting but I don't have an understanding of it of okay. like why the bonds why do people watch the bonds why does it have an impact on FX yeah what do what do bonds, bonds even represent so there's three pillars to FX so the markets will lean on three aspects of, of, of everything because all the markets are interlinked with each other number one you've got rates so what are interest rates doing what are the bond market doing because obviously the yield aspect number two commodities so what we just mentioned about oil prices gas prices mm. that gives you trade ideas number three equity markets because when equity markets rally there's a reason for that and that tends to be because they're not slightly more risk on they're happy with the risk environment and then you think okay in that environment dollar sells off aussie dollar rallies because it's risk on currencies high beta basically it's very sensitive so from a rates perspective, which is the bond market or, and interest rates and everything between that, the reason why, or you got, number one, you got to think, what is the bond market? So the bond market is, think of it like a an IOU or a coupon. Mm -hmm. So you come to think of myself as the government, you come to me, I'd say, okay, I'm offering you 2% a year for the next five years. So you buy a five-year treasury mm -hmm. yield or a five-year treasury bond. So the yield is the 2%. The way the markets would view it as is because it gives you an idea of what the Fed is going to do as well, what the central banks are going to do. So you look at like the treasury market, which is obviously the US. You look at the gilt market, which is the UK, the bond market, which is the German bonds, um, the JGBs, which is Japan. You look at that and the markets from an investor perspective or from FX trader perspective, it gives you an idea of who's more hawkish because if yields are climbing, that tends to be markets are a little bit more hawkish mm -hmm. because the way they view it out or the way the markets would view it as is as yields climb, it becomes slightly more risky because the, the reason why yields climb is become it, it's seen as slightly more risky to hold because when rates are risen, you have higher risks of defaulting, et cetera. Yeah. Unlikely to pay it back. So the way the markets would do is they sell the bonds. It's a really complicated market, don't get me wrong. No like it's a super complicated market. Uh, the bond market is really, really difficult. But the way they do it is they sell the bond back. That pushes yields higher because now it has to the markets or in the secondary market they have to they have to create a demand. The, the government also has to create a demand. So they're saying, "Oh, people are selling their bonds. We need to push yields higher to make it more attractive." So, but the way markets will do it is as that yield climbs, it's slightly more attractive. Now investors from elsewhere are changing their currency into dollars to buy that treasury note, and from a, an aspect of a trader that increases the demand for the dollar. Mm -hmm. And that's why it, it rises as well. So it gives you an idea of what the central bank is going to do because as central banks are raising rates, it becomes more and more, more, more risky. So the bond has to, uh, the yield have to counter that. Mm -hmm. So it has to rise and rise and rise. The markets will think as from a political aspect, number one, US is pretty good. Data is pretty decent as well. Growth, pretty good, etc. Okay, the risk of defaulting on that bond is super low. So let's buy that. And that creates a demand for the dollar. So they'll do this exactly the same framework for the Fed, and the treasury market, they'll do it for the gilt market, the UK market, the boom market, the, the European market. So, because we had an issue with the gilts, right? Uh, not too long ago, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that was, uh, I think, last year, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. When there was a lot of issuance. That's um, when we had a uh, trust. Was in power? We had some random person in power. List trust, was, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <List laughs> trust, random. Yeah. <laughs> Who? <laughs> yeah, the list trust issue. It so, the shortest reign ever as, as yeah, a prime yeah. minister. She gets paid 100 grand now. You know that. It's not a bad gig. It's not a bad gig. It's not a bad couple of months, gets 100 grand a year, every but year. Yeah, it was during her, her reign. Well, I say reign like she's a queen. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, what's the what's the terminology for it? Her, Empower, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, as prime minister. Yeah. yeah. Um, so why did yields climb yeah. extremely aggressively? So the issue why, you got to remember, is why did the pound sell off so aggressively? Mm -hmm. So pound or GU sold super low, like it went like that. Reason you got very for, close to parity, right? Very close, like 102. Um, we sold it from 138, actually. 
during <laughs> during 2021. We're going so. to come on to your mad swings <laughs> in a minute. Yeah. So yeah, the issue the, or the way why the bond market just went into frenzy is because the way Trust was presenting and Quateng as well, the way they were presenting it is they're going to do all these tax cuts, which is good for the economy, but that money has to come from somewhere. Yeah. So the markets are like, well, where is the money going to come from? And then all of the issues with issuance and and again, as we was mentioning about how yields climb, it increases the, the volatility or increases the likelihood of you defaulting. The market's like, nope, we're selling every single bond we own. Yields climbed as a result of that and, and yields spiked. Uh, and that created that worried some in the market. So yields can climb and the currency falls, but it's important to, un don't think of it like a, it's not a one-to-one -one correlation. Nothing in the market is one-to-one -one correlation. It's the context as well is important. Be, yeah. The context is important. So like we was mentioning earlier about how inflation rises, currency rallies. Sometimes inflation rises, central bank cut for increases rates, currency weakens. So that may be because one, as, as rates are rising, as we was mentioning, becomes more and more and more indebted, mm -hmm. becomes more and more risky. But if the economy is really weak anyway, that just applies more risk, more more pressure, and that weakens the currency further. So G pound, perfect example, June 2022, sold off fairly drastically because the economy, the UK economy was not great. Inflation was rising. Bank of England was pretty hawkish. Guilt yields were rising as well. But the markets are feeling that this is going to apply more pressure. So let's sell the pound. Mm -hmm. That's what they did. So yeah, it all, the bond market all interlinks with each other. It's Really, really interesting person. How do you, What would? where would you advise people to begin to learn? Yeah. Beginning, <laughs> I, beginner steps. I just started Googling YouTube videos, to be honest yeah. with you. Uh, I watch a lot of live. Do you put anything out yourself in regards to these things? Uh, we obviously, from our, the collab with Zane anyway, on, on Thursday, we, we cover all of that. But, you know, it's going to take a lot of work, don't get me wrong. But from a research perspective, you got to remember, you got to, Firstly, I understand the basics of fundamentals. So what I was mentioning about the GDP, the inflation, the interest rates, mm. central banks as well. So you want to learn that first. That's like your foundation. First, have that first because you don't want to move on to a really complex without understanding the basics. Right? You're going to get confused. So then you go and say, okay, I have a really good foundation now. Mm -hmm. The bond market is now the next step or, or the application. What drives the bond market? Why does the bond market move? So all you got to do is just apply the same framework you had with the FX space. Mm -hmm to the bond market how important would you say asking good questions is as a, as a learner as someone who needs to master this skill set because as you said there what is the bond market you know these are questions very clear very simple questions yeah to a degree but like it's a complex subject mm -hmm. how important even as a technical trader how important is it to ask these questions as you're trying to master the skill set because most people as i said they're in the losing position yeah they're not where they want to be they're not at that winning stage they're not at that consistently mm -hmm. profitable stage Nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. But the issue is I find is that majority of people are lazy as well. So they're lazy and not profitable, right? And therefore, what is it that allows them to be profitable? And I would say, you know, based on obviously our conversation as well, is that yeah. asking good questions is such a very simple yet powerful tool mm -hmm. to make that change. What you know, From your experience and obviously working with other traders as well, what, what would you say to that? It's definitely a big, 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 big aspect of your, of your journey. So you obviously need to obviously have a good mentor. If you don't have a good mentor, you can just ask good traders. Mm -hmm. Like, how did you get into that position? Like, what did you do differently? Uh, you don't have to exactly copy and paste it because you want to be individual, of course. But just apply the sort of the logic behind, oh, maybe their work-life balance is good. Maybe they've got a good relationship at home because, again, all of this outside stuff, forget about the FX, in, you know, it, it bleeds through into your, your, your sort of trading. So... Ask the simple questions like, how well am I sleeping? How well is my relationship at the moment? Is there any issues I've got? Is how am I going, am I doing a lot of exercise, which is important. So ask the most basic questions first. And in terms of the trading aspect, then it's a lot more simpler. Now you've got to think, okay, I'm doing this, or I'm marking at this demand level or this order block or support. They all work, technicals, every single thing works. Um, why are you looking at it from this aspect? Why, why are you looking at it down from here rather mm -hmm. than up here, for example? So just ask the most basic questions in terms of trading. Uh, but yeah, ask yourself the most important ones first, which is how's my sleep? Because if you have bad sleep, then again, mm -hmm. we've all you know woken up from really bad sleep. You think you're going to trade really well in that environment? Of course not. So just ask those questions first and then just the simple ones of trading. Why did you do this different here? Or you know, yeah. ask other traders as well. Well, you mentioned earlier a particular trade. 
selling mm-hmm. from 1.38, right? It comes down <laughs> yeah, towards par- uh, parity on GU, yes. Um, so the real question that sticks out to me there, I'm sure there's other things on in terms of strategy which we'll come on to, but the real one is obviously those issues with the pound, the, mm-hmm. the, the dire issues when we were getting towards parity there, they came out as we were closer yeah. to parity. So what allowed you... So that you want the application of fundamentals to technicals, is that... Yeah, well, I'm wondering, how did you then swing from up there? Because at that time, no doubt if it's at a high or at a high point, no doubt because price is there already, Mm -hmm. what were the indications to allow you to sell and hold rather than obviously thinking? Because I'm guessing to be at that high point, my guess would be, or my assumption would be that pound must have been at a strong point. It was, yeah. Uh, So what was it that led you to say, okay, let's take this position and we have the confidence to hold? hold. Yeah, okay, so... Like I briefly mentioned it before, but think about why the markets are moving. So why did GU pump from all the way at the lows when the dollar rallied really aggressively, obviously that pushed GU lower, to then rally extremely high to towards 140. Think about the reason why that rose. So it rose because the UK at that time was doing a lot of their COVID vaccines really well. They were mm. one of the first and one of the, the fastest in terms of their vaccination. So the thought process was then, okay, the UK is now going to go back to normal quicker. Mm. So that means growth is going to be a little bit better. Inflation is going to rise as a result of that reopening. What do you think happens then to the Bank of England? So if inflation is rising, they then... Uh, increasing rates? Yeah. That thought process. They don't have to necessarily do it at the meeting. but the I'm thought, disappointed in myself. <laughs> disappointed. The thought process is that. Um, so that then allowed, okay, growth is getting slightly better. The vaccination process is getting really good. That creates that risk on environment. Pound is a risk on, on currency. That drove the pound higher. We then got to a point where at the time, the dollar sold off super aggressively. So thinking about those HSBC trading rules. Yeah. So then now the recovery in the US was starting to happen, whereas the UK was starting to peak okay. that data. So that convergence, when it's like this, yeah. drove GU lower. So all you're doing is allow or think about the reason why it rallied to then think the opposite. So reason rally, data was good, COVID, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, now we're starting to see a switch in that data. Oh, now GDP is coming in slightly weaker. Oh, inflation, yes, is coming in slightly better. It's like a domino effect. Yeah. And now you think, okay, oh, unemployment rate's not good. Oh, the retail sales is poor. Services PMI is not great here, et cetera, or the components within the PMIs. Now what you're doing is just comparing. Because remember, Mm. you're trading GBP, the UK, versus the US economy. Yes. Similar to, and I think I saw one of your reels, I think one of your, your guys from... SFT about euro dollar. Mm-hmm. It's a pretty good, good, good real. You're trading Europe versus the US economy. Yeah. So all you're doing is you're trading the UK economy versus the US economy. You're comparing the data and then that gives you an idea to trade it. Now the application to that's very different. So there's two, two elements to trading. There's the fundamental view. So the overall view. Yeah. And there's the tactical view. So for example, as of right now, we are fundamentally bearish the dollar. Because, again, as the Fed starts to cut rates, it becomes better for risk environment. That then allows the dollar to sell off. The Aussie dollar will rally. The yen will also strengthen as a function of the bond market. Uh, yields will fall as well. So bull steepness is when two-year yields fall quicker than a 10-year. Two-year yields represent policy mm-hmm. because it's very short-term maturity. 10-year represents the growth of the economy. Mm-hmm. So as the 10-year yields are falling or the two years, that tells you everything there. So obviously, we're not going to get into that because it's a massive aspect of the bond market. <laughs> but... All you're doing is just then thinking about a tactical view. So our tactical view is higher dollar in the near term, potential of hawkish Fed. But then we know at some point we want to get into a long in euro dollar. We want to get into a long in GE. We just got to think about timing. Mm-hmm. Timing is really important. So all we're doing is thinking, okay, from the GBP USD perspective is, oh, we're starting to see weaker data. Oh, structure's breaking. How convenient of that. So as I was mentioning before about how the fundamentals or the technicals is a reflection of what's happening fundamentally. Yeah. That's why sometimes when you see Wyckoff accumulation, yeah. the markets are bullish, the dollar, they're just waiting. And that creates that consolidation. If you're yeah. trading two strong economies against each other, consolidation happens. If you're trading unsure markets because they're waiting for data, consolidates. Mm-hmm. So it's it's not necessarily a, a technical reasoning. It, it's just a fundamental reasoning. So all you're doing is then, oh, GBP, USD is breaking structure. Then you apply your technicals, whatever technicals you want to use. RBC, capital markets, they use support and resistance. They use uh, pivot levels. Mm. They use um, Fibonacci, Bank of America. Similarly, they use support and resistance. They use Fibonacci. I can show you all their technical analysis. Uh, HSBC, they use 
simple levels. They use big key levels, 110, you know, um, quarter theory. Yeah. I think it's called quarter theory. 25s, 50s, 75s, and zeros. Yeah. They use all that element, 125 for GU or 110 for, for euro dollar. They'll look at that level. They're not going to say, oh, it's breaking above it. Let's wait for the retest and buy it. Or, oh, it's pulling back into this mm -hmm. demand. Let's buy it or supply and sell it. They're going to use the fundamentals as a way of getting into that position. So they'll yeah. think, oh, timing seems right now. The reason it was rallying, oh, now that's starting to switch. Our oh, structure's being broken. Let's wait for the pull, but let's sell it. Now, stop loss is actually pretty big normally. They're, I've seen Goldman Sachs give a, a, a stop loss of 150 pips on EuroCAD, but obviously their, their take profit's massively low, right? So yeah. risk to reward ratio is in, in their favor. Um, but yeah, again, it is, it's just applying the fundamental view. Tactical view is the short-term view, what's mm -hmm. happening as of today. Mm -hmm. Fundamental view is the longer-term view. Obviously, that takes a bit more work, a bit more experience, but that will come, of course. Uh, and then all you're doing is just working out, okay, technicals are breaking here. Fundamentally, it makes a lot of sense as well. Let's just get into sales. Yeah. So that's what we did. is just waited for some structural breaks because that gives us the element of, okay, now from a technical perspective, it makes a lot of sense because yeah. they work hand in hand, right? Fundamentals gives you direction. Technicals gives you the entry. You want to work hand in hand with that. And that's yeah. what we did for GU. So then we just that. held it. And what we were doing is watching days. Oh, it's coming weaker. We're not going to exit our sales. Why are we going to do that? It's going to go weaker. And I oh, was doing that. And then at the time, the dollar was rallying super aggressively in 22. And we're just comparing it, just constantly comparing, 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 comparing. And then that gives us a reason to get out or to continue to sell it. So yeah. that's how we do it. That's incredible. <laughs> that's incredible. And, you know, again, I think I asked you this earlier. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if we, I know the fundamentals was that a part of the answer in terms of like having the confidence to hold. Yep. But is that simply it in terms of building that patience to yep. hold those trades for that amount of time? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. All you're doing is just, Again, the fundamentals gives you that clarity, right? Yeah. So you can't understand from a technical perspective. This is why technicals work to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. So you got to think, okay, there's a reason why the market's moving. All you're doing is following that reason. Yeah. So if the reasons tell you, you it's going to go lower, why are you going to exit? Now, I know some people will think, how does this apply to your intraday trades? Yeah. That's when you have to be more tactical with your positions. So for example... If you entered this year, which we we turned bullish the dollar in ta from a tactical short term perspective at the start of the year, because it was super o uh, overextended the downside, the data was telling us cuts were going to get pushed back. So we think, okay, dollar's going to rally. Then all we do from a, a um, intraday perspective is only look for buys on, on the dollar. So yeah. oh, GU pushing lower. I'll wait for the pullback, like, sell that. Or euro dollars pushing lower. Wait for the pullback, sell it. Wait for the pullback, sell it. And that's what you're doing from a from a tech, technical perspective is running with that view and don't mm -hmm. go opposite to it because then you're going against the whole market. And then you're just going, is that the short term view? And then but the long term view is yeah. still the dollar's yeah. weak. Yeah, yeah, that's what that's what we're expecting. So we're in agreement with like Goldman, BNB Paribas. Um we understand why HSBC are bullish it mm -hmm. because the days are still pretty good in the US relative to Europe. So Euro dollars should be lower. I do understand that. But the way the markets are reacting is telling me otherwise. Okay. So again, that reaction function. Now, don't get me wrong. If we then start to see the data in the US print better and dollar still rallying, then mm -hmm. fine, we'll hold our tactical views that could then switch into a fundamental view. Yeah. So it's important to just follow the, the ideas and, yeah. and go with it. So. And what do you think in terms of, uh, what do you need to see to um, see that change, right? So like right now you're thinking short-term bullish for the dollar. Yeah. What is it that you're looking for to then switch that back? So apply the same framework as we was mentioned before. Why has the dollar rallied? Number one, super over that or extremely, you know, sold off. Cuts are getting pushed back. Mm -hmm. That's the reason why the dollar rallied. Fine, we agree with that. Then all you got to think is the opposite side. So maybe for the dollar to sell off, we need to see lower inflation, mm. which then leads to rate not cu cuts. Yeah. yeah. Lower inflation then brings... I'm getting there. <laughs> yeah. it's, there. it's not necessarily inflation comes a week. Oh, now they're going to start cutting. It's just a different It's the variable. thought process. Yeah. It's the thought process. Oh, inflation coming a week. So how, how would it normally go down? I'm, I'm guessing normally it would go down where you know, the inflation, let's say, comes lower. Um, and then they say, okay, they don't just cut. They would then say in their next, say, FOMC meeting. But they'll be a lot more dovish, yeah. Yeah. So do they, do they not like come out straight and say, next meeting we're cutting? Will it more so be like where it's something's on the table? Like, yeah, they'll, it's more they'll like, say more politically. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah so yeah. they're not going to directly say it, but they'll say it in some very nuanced way. Yeah. Uh, and the markets would see that, oh, that's really, really dovish. Mm -hmm. And then they'll see, then they'll just watch the data up until the next meeting and say, actually, they're going to probably cut now because yeah. the data tells them to. Is there uh, anything, as someone who actually is in the fundamental side, is there anything outside of, say, Forex Factory and the usual sites mm -hmm. that you're looking at? 
yeah, that maybe the average person won't know? Uh, Bloomberg, pretty good. Bloomberg is, I've, I've used that for quite a few years now. Uh, Reuters, Reuters is good. It's a free website as well. Mm -hmm. uh, you can look at ING. ING is a bank. Uh, you can look at uh, Pound Sterling. That's another website you can use for your, for your data or not your data for your news. Mm. Um, and there's, again, it, the Forex Factory and stuff like that is just giving you the, the calendar. That's all I use it yeah. for is the calendar. I've always used Forex Factory since I started. It's really clean, really simple. I like it. Trade and Economics as well. So that has the calendar on there, but then it also has all of the data you need. So Trade and Economics will give you the GDP data, the inflation data, the interest yeah. rate data. Um, so yeah, from, from a news perspective, Bloomberg, Reuters, ING is pretty good, Pound Sterling. So those four are pretty decent. Is there anything that you pay for outside of that? Uh, not really, no. You can get a lot for free uh, out there. I know a lot of people are like, oh, you can pay. You can if you want to. Don't get, if you can pay for, if you can afford a Bloomberg terminal, buy it. But if you got $24,000 to just splash away at a, a software, fine. But you don't need to. A lot of the the, the stuff out there is, is for free. Yeah. Remember, the data will tell you what's going to happen. Yeah, the news articles is just a reflection of what the data has said. So that mm -hmm. will say, "Oh, Bloomberg has said inflation coming weaker. Maybe the Fed's more dovish." Or ING said PMIs is coming weaker. That means the Bank of England's now going to be more dovish. Yeah. So it's important to understand the data, and then that the news and stuff is just a clarity thing. It's that another confluence, if you will. Definitely. Yeah. In terms of your technicals, is there anything? So you have the fundamentals, right? Is there anything specific, like a mechanical aspect to your technicals that you need to see? Yeah, so my technicals are no different to everybody else's. So the issue for nowadays actually is a lot of the technical traders, yeah. they apply the same thing over and over and over and over again and are expecting different results. Mm -hmm. So the markets are very fluid. They work in different aspects. That's why sometimes your demand candles or your institutional candle, which doesn't exist, but institutional candle is going to get hit. Sometimes it doesn't get hit. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it hits off support levels. Because what I've noticed is a lot of people talk about fair value gaps and, and balances. Yeah. Uh, people talk about change of character, uh -huh. break your structure. They all mean the same stuff, right? Uh, but if you look to your left, it comes into areas of support or comes into areas of resistance. So how could you argue that that doesn't work? Yeah. So I incorporate everything. So I look at the key levels, HSBC technicals of 125s and 110s and 111s, 112s. From an a entry strategy, I will use supply and demand. Is, seems to work for me. Uh, I'll then incorporate a bit of support. So oh, look, there's a big support level here. Oh, that's lining up with this sort of demand candle here. Okay, that makes sense. Fundamentally, we're long as well. Seems yeah. like going forward, that's going to happen. Okay, let's long it from there. Technic and then stop losses for me, just below the low or like below the big low on that candle. Yeah. So that could be 30 pips, could be 40, could be 50, could be 60. But then my target is higher. Because I'm mm -hmm. fundamentally long that currency. So yeah. technicals is just like I mentioned, it's an entry. What sort of time frames are you are you observing? So I will go from the weekly. I'll look at the weekly candle. Uh, I'll like a supply and demand candle. So if I'm buying, obviously I'm looking for demand candles. So I'll go on the weekly. Oh, there's a demand candle there. Now let me go down to the daily mm -hmm. and refine that. Just because I want to get a better risk reward, of course. Then down to the 12, to the 8, to the 6, to the 4. Just to refine that candle a bit more. Yeah. But I'll, I'll mark out the level. So I'll mark out a range and say, okay, a box here. Of, of, uh, of demand. Yeah. And then go, oh, look, there's a daily just below that box. Okay, let me just extend that box. This is a region, mm -hmm. right? You, you don't know where the market's going to reverse from. Yeah. So you need to have your understanding of, okay, this region, if we start to see bullish structure form, break a structure to the upside, pull back, fine, now you can get in. Or a two candle swing, which is another entry strategy that's commonly used where you want bullish, two bullish consecutive candles one after another. Yeah. So, yeah, from a, from a, technical perspective that's it like, it's, it's no different to everybody else it's just mm. i can hold my position longer so you won't because, go lower than the four no no unless it's i'm looking for a break of structure out of that region okay so if i'm like okay i want to be 100 percent at the moment i'm a little bit unsure i'm just waiting for a bit more data to come out i want to see a bit of a break of structure because remember the technicals are a reflection of what's happening fundamentally yeah. so if you're saying okay it's breaking from structure okay looks like it's going to be starting to turn bullish then i'll drop to the to the sort of hourly maybe yeah. the 30 minute mm -hmm. 45 minute and the same same exact technical so i've done from the high time frame just apply it Look, to the lower time frame yeah. that's it like, there's that. no difference everyone else one thing you just said there which i find very interesting is like the technicals are just following what the fundamentals are doing yeah. how often have you heard the opposite where people say the fundamentals you know is just 
the technicals are telling us beforehand. Does that make sense? Like that's why a lot of people don't learn fundamentals. That's one reason I didn't. Is because yeah. I was like, you know, whatever happens fundamentally is showing me technically. You know, yeah. so I'm doing it the other way around as an excuse not to learn fundamentals. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, I get what you. What mean. do you What do you think to that? Um, I can understand it. I think it's like don't get, no offense, but it's like a cheap cheap way out if you are <laughs> it's a cheap no, it's like fair, it, it is fair. like don't get me wrong like like I mean, the funny thing is i've never thought about it the other way around i've always just been like yeah fundamental i, I know they're so important and i yeah. know they drive the markets for sure and then they provide the volatility and a lot of the larger movements in the markets come off the back of fundamentals uh when we have a lack of them as we can see from the markets at the moment yeah uh, this is what happens and for some people this is like prime time markets for them like the scalpers and the, yeah, probably I maybe the day that. traders yeah for me especially now as the switch may, few months back, this would have been amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, now with the switch, this is like the worst, not worst thing ever, but it's like be patient. Yeah, Be patient and, and yeah. control. Um, but yeah, like uh, it was an excuse, really. Like yeah. I said, it's like I don't need to learn fundamentals because the technicals show me, right? Yeah. And then the technicals so seem to work. If I and, show you a chart, could you tell me what's going to happen fundamentally? No. Could you tell me where the currency is going to go? Mm -hmm. no. like, if I just give you a chart? Could I, you could, I could try to predict, for example... You can say, oh, it's breaking this structure, yeah, it's exactly. this fair value gap, whatever, yeah. whatever. But that doesn't give you the reason why. If you want to, everyone bangs on about trading like a bank, yeah. but you don't look at what the banks are doing. Or you don't look at the reasons why the banks will be buying at something. you got to remember, all these traders who are discretionary, so they're physically going out on behalf of the clients or the bank and going out to buy that, you're not interested in what the market makers are doing because, like I mentioned before, they're not out to take your stops. They, they've got regulatory reasons to not do that. They've got to constantly provide liquidity to the market. So they're buying in downtrends and buying, selling in uptrends, of course. Um, but from a sort of bank perspective, they have their reasons first, and then their technicals is an application of what their yeah. reasoning is. So you would so, say this is how the banks trade. Fundamentals. Yeah, they look at the fundamentals. Foundation. I, can, we can, I can give you all of their reasons why they enter the markets. I can give you their HSBC reasons. I can show you their technical analysis. I know some people then say, oh, you know, they're doing that just so that they can fool the retail. Trust me, they don't care about us. They're making their money elsewhere in the bank. Why yeah. would they want to take out our little stop losses? It just makes no sense. I think, do you feel like it's an excuse, very similar to what I said about the whole technical thing there? Do you mean that argument or when people say that, that's an excuse for their poor trading? Yeah, you know, I like agree. Just them not being disciplined. Because at the end of the day, how is it that there are profitable retail traders i don't know why i did that because they are retail traders yeah, yeah. um but how come there are profitable retail traders because if surely if they're after there won't be any they'll mm -hmm. just be after all of us yeah but then the argument might be but they let us have hope by seeing <laughs> by seeing one yeah i always see these arguments it's just do you feel like really though it's not market makers that are targeting us or banks no one's essentially targeting us but they can be bad brokers right? yeah yeah absolutely bad brokers do exist mm -hmm. you know off offshore unregulated brokers, for example, mm -hmm. they have, I know like a lot of people who are in prop firms, they always complain about like slippage and stuff like that. Yeah. It's like the same stuff for like with the retail brokers. So yes, the brokers can do that fine. Like if they're unregulated, you, there's nothing you can do about that. But mm -hmm. that's why you always go to a regulated broker because they're not allowed to do that. Mm -hmm. And if you do, then you can complain and then you should get some sort of compensation back. So yeah. uh, don't get me wrong, there are bad market makers out there. But let's be real, how often does that happen? Mm -hmm. like how often do you see this guy's getting penalized because of bad market makers? 100%, that's what I was going to say. Like the repercussions in that position is Mill so that The high. fees are, like the, the actual like fine is millions mm -hmm. to do that. I personally want to take that, I'm sure you wouldn't want it. No, wouldn't Just know. to take out a couple of retail stops, mm -hmm. that makes no sense. I had a I had the pleasure of going to Wall Street, and I saw I, that I was pretty cool. Yeah, no, I, I interviewed uh, one of the traders from the floor, which will come out soon. Um, fingers crossed yeah, in the coming cool. coming weeks. But uh, he told me a really interesting story about market. Well, he he's been there for decades, mm -hmm. so he's been there since they used to use paper, you know, for the orders, etc. And uh, it was the weirdest thing is the story was off camera, which is really unfortunate because it's an incredible story. But I said to him, like, what's the craziest thing you've seen on the floor? Mm. You know, and he said, like, back in the day when there used to be like thousands of people on the floor. Now there's barely anyone because yeah. of technology. But thousands of people, he goes, one of the market makers, uh, market makers had a heart attack. Right. But they can't stop trading. So, so they, they just so they traded over the body. Oh. Right. And they had to wait until trading had finished to then Bam. move the body, um, which is insane. Right, it's a crazy story. And it just shows you though the advancements of this industry, yeah. right? And and trading as a whole, because that is literally how you would have to place your I actually saw a clip.
think it was from Drew, um, uh, who's part of obviously ZMC. Beaumont. Oh, Beaumont Dow looks better. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Like the collab as well. But um, he, I think it was him. If I'm not mistaken, I hope I'm not. But he was basically saying like, you know, decades ago, yeah, if you yeah, wanted to get an order, yeah. you would have to phone, you, you would keep track of the levels that are being shown uh, through the paper or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, it would be the paper mainly. Yep. Um, then you would call your broker to place orders, etc. Um, and yeah, that was that is how it would have been done. But now we have obviously all on our phone. We have the price levels there every single second of the day. Yeah, you know, and the price movements, which is insane. And I think we sometimes take it for granted because of our lack of. I think research comes into that, right? If you were able to understand that, even then, experience obviously is another thing. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I feel like we take it for granted how easy trading is today in comparison yeah so i think i saw like a, a reel that you've done about somebody saying the barrier to entry is really low i think it was exactly. a really, yeah that's really come out recently as well yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're all there so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah but the barrier to entry is really low which yeah. i do agree with like you can just like he mentioned i can't remember his name but he was like oh is a have, z yeah yeah you can just have your phone internet broker done that's Put it, some yeah. money in and you're, you're sorted it's a dangerous thing i think it's a it's an incredible thing right and this is how i like to see things like there's a balance mm -hmm. right and uh, like, just as that's a beautiful thing, like anyone can get into trading, you don't need a lot of money to start. It's probably the most dangerous thing as well at the same time, mm -hmm. because then people just throw, throw, throw. I threw loads of money at trading to begin with, which yeah. I didn't need to. If I just take a step back to learn, right? And go through the process we kind of talked about today in terms of building that foundation. Mm -hmm. If I had done that, I would have saved myself tens of thousands. I didn't yeah. have to go to the, the market maker who attacked me, <laughs> 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 who took the money from me. Um, I've got an interesting question for you because sure. it's, it's like a, the conspiracy, if you will, that people talk about. Mm -hmm. um, but like the world's in debt, essentially. There's a clock in New York that I've seen. And the weirdest thing is the clock is in like some alleyway, which is the weirdest thing. Oh, okay. But Fair it's enough. the national debt clock. Uh, is that for, the one on the, the website US. as well? I it's think. the same as the website, yeah. It tracks the website. But it's like this random alleyway in New York that I saw and it had the debt clock just in this alleyway. It's, is it just that? <laughs> yeah, but it's just the weirdest <laughs> thing because it's just in this alleyway. It's not like on a main street and it's... Yeah. Anyway, um, so that's the US, but the world essentially is also in debt. But who do, who are they in debt to? There's all these conspiracies and, and people always ponder on this question. But as maybe a fundamental trader, maybe you could understand or have an understanding of where that arises from. Or It's normally in debt to other economies. Okay. So there must be one rich one out there. Then. <laughs> there must be one who <laughs> like just Everyone owns borrows all from them. everyone. That's the thing. So everyone's yeah. indebted to everybody. So I don't know how... So is it a that. bubble then? In the yeah, end? essentially it is, but it's just a bubble that's always just going to keep growing. You don't think it could pop? Eventually. <laughs> like, if it pops, what's going to happen? Every, like, this is, this is yeah, the question. Yeah, like, well, are they going to just write off all of the debt and just start from ground like ground zero again? Like, what are they, they going to do? Mm. So I, I'd have to do more research into that, to be honest with you. It is a weird one, though, isn't like, it? Because yeah. it's like, if it was to pop, Right, you have two options, like you said. One option is they reset to zero, but then how does that impact the whole world? If essentially does it, it just go on again? Or... Yeah, because the other option is nothing happens. Everything popped. That means everything's collapsed mm -hmm. essentially, um, and it's yeah. the weirdest thing. So then, yeah. essentially, you, is your thought process of that it won't pop for that very reason? That if it did, everything would just be to me. Yeah, that seems like the most logical one. Yeah, like yeah, I, don't, I know there's conspiracies out there, like oh. You know, there's gonna this this great reset and all that stuff. Yeah, people talk about that. I don't understand it to a, a great degree because uh, same thing. Like, if, if, what is the reset? What about when you hear about um, CBDCs? Oh yeah, yeah. Right. Um, is that something to worry about? Because that's what a lot of people talk about. I mean, universal yeah, basic income, etc. Yeah, it is worrying. I mean, like people kind of means that now the government can now track you, sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So what you're spending and and where you're going. So. And they can literally then at that point just shut off your account. Mm -hmm. like, pop, it's now gone, sort of thing. So, do you feel there's a is there any benefit to that from like this these fundamentals we've been talking about? Is there any benefit to the the governments or banks having that sort of control or insight? Yeah, it would fundamentals will still be very important. Like the markets and, and the investors will still look at what the inflation. You feel like it would do. get more precise though. Because they'll actually have the data yeah, it's, to it's, say they're spending this much. It's difficult to say though, money. isn't it? Like mm. it's difficult to say because you've got to remember, like like the example he was giving us about the paper. Yeah. Like people who were trading in that time in in the paper days, how would they have then thought what the technology is going to be like? Like yeah. obviously I weren't born then, but you see what I mean? Like how yeah. what were their thought process back then and how were they what were they thinking? So yeah. it's kind of the same question. Like we don't really know. <laughs> yeah. Until until we kind of see it. 
be interesting to see. I heard who was saying it to me. I think it was one of the editors actually. They were saying that they're testing universal basic income in Wales at the moment. Okay. Um, it should be interesting. It should be interesting because there's a there's a film called In Time. Oh, is that and the one with the numbers? Yes. Yeah, Justin, yeah. yeah. Not many people have seen it. It's you? pretty good, yeah. There you go. Decent. There you go. You haven't watched The Crown, but you've seen this. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but yeah, so essentially, for those who haven't seen it, they've got a, a clock on their wrist uh, or their forearm. Yeah. And essentially, when the clock goes to zero, they die. And the clock starts when they turn 18. So it's like a, not a conspiracy, but it's kind of like an analogy, I guess. Mm -hmm. Time is money, if you will, your yeah. currency. So they get paid in the time. They spend the time. Um, and... You have one year on your clock, and it starts when you turn eighteen, I believe. Yeah. And um, and yeah, so universal basic income is essentially them. Like they we give you this, you know, they give you the uh, time if you will, the money um, every month. Let's say a thousand pounds, you get that, but it only comes in CBDC. So it, in this essence, it only comes in the in the time. Yeah. You know, the clock, if you will. Um, which I guess I think the the mindset behind that is is that's how they will get people to accept this change. You know. Is that we will offer you a Makes universal sense. basic income, but it's only going to be paid in CBDCs, and therefore the majority of people probably would accept it. You know, imagine you don't work any, you don't work a day at all. I was actually you get funny this. enough. Yeah, I was actually listening to a Joe Rogan podcast of, on the way up here about mm. that. Um, was it the guy from the UK talking about it? No, it's Ice Cube. You know, the, the rapper. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Definitely wasn't the but, same guy. Yeah. <laughs> but Joe Rogan was talking about about how. The CBDC aspect about how people are worried about like the like tracking you and the but the way they said or the way him and Ice Cube are talking about about how they how are they going to actually enforce that? Mm. Um, I think he was talking about how there needs to be like another pandemic or another big global issue to then say, oh, by the way, you need to do this yes. now and people well, accept the, it. So. That's the interesting thing though, because like that's we went more way more cashless during that little cycle. Yeah. It was like, what, a two-year period at most? I agree, yeah. And it was like, we went heavily cashless. There's still companies now that don't accept cash. Yeah. Um, and it really introduced a lot of, uh, you know, isolation. Mm -hmm. So even though we're more, of, we're, we're not in lockdown, if you will, but it's introduced the idea of being sort of away from people a bit more. I agree. Working from home. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot more people got into a heavy gaming, for example, and they've you kept on that. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but they kept into that routine, if you will. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's kind of pushing, and especially what the advancements of uh, VR, AR is is increasing. So I know this is my conspiracy head, but yeah, this <laughs> is uh, the way I see it is like the advancements of those technologies mm -hmm. will only promote us to be home more. And whether the pandemic, uh, pandemic, sorry, is something that is going to continue to be a reoccurring theme in our future or not, mm -hmm. if it is, it only promotes more of that way of uh, you know, society, if you will, which then only ne creates a, necess uh, a necessity yeah. for CBDCs. Because if you think about uh, our games, right, you have all this virtual currency in the games. Mm -hmm. so, like Amazon has a wallet, you know, uh, PlayStation Network has a wallet. Yeah. Like they all have wallets already that you can top up to then spend on, right? And it's the same principle then. Once you're in a VR, if it, once everyone's attached to VR, and if anyone hasn't tried VR, mm -hmm. I have like a couple of times. Once you've tried it, you realize just, and this is at this stage, yeah. right? Yeah. Infancy, like, well, not maybe the complete infancy, but it's like- It's more recent though, isn't it? Like yeah, but VR it's like, it's at a stage where you can get hooked and it's really- It's that like- it's like that film, isn't it? Ready Player One. Exactly, and I love that film. Yeah, it's pretty decent. Actually. But once once it's at that level, which I imagine it probably would get Eventually, to, yeah, that's when that's when the, the reality will kick in that people will be hooked to it because it's like Inception. You remember in Inception, the movie they, um, there's an area in the, or part of the movie where they're sort of going into space and people are just pay, it's like a drug. People are paying to be put to sleep. Oh into yeah, the yeah, dream yeah. world, right? It's the same principle. We all want escapism. That's why people are addicted to games or addicted to all these different things is because we want that escapism. So like what is the greatest escape of all is obviously a VR virtual reality True. where you can do absolutely anything and everything and have this freedom and escape this reality. Mm -hmm. um, it's pretty good though. Like VRs are pretty it good. It is fun. Now, this is what I mean. This is why it's so dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> My guy out here, he has one. He does his work in it, right? He does Fair his enough. editing work wow. using it. Um, but it's more like AR as well. It has an AR Is that capability. the MetaQuest, is it? Yes, the Quest 3, yeah. Um, and then that's another thing. Yeah, Facebook owning it. <laughs> it's like Apple now, isn't it? They're having that Vision Pro. 
Yes, yeah, everyone's got one. Um, but it'll be interesting to see what the future holds. I know we got off track there. Yes. How we did that. <laughs> I apologize. That's me. <laughs> uh, that's me. I've always don't get me wrong. This is the when I got into podcasting. Yeah. The whole mindset was obviously to have powerful conversations, of course. But the whole mindset was to have like such a dive. It all comes from Joe Rogan, and this is something I realized with Joe Rogan though is that I had to learn this when I started podcasting. Is he's a comedian. Right, so he's able to have like a serious guest on, but make it entertaining or funny because true, he actually. is a comedian. So no one's gonna bat an eyelid when he's making a joke or done something like that, right? Or has like an entertainment aspect to it. Yeah, I'm not a comedian, <laughs> so when people watch this podcast, they're not looking for me to be like telling jokes or something like that. And I had to learn that very quick because at the <laughs> beginning, so I literally fun. used to, as you can imagine, I didn't really have guests and stuff. So I had uh, like my friends on, and yeah. we would just laugh and joke. And then I would wonder like, why isn't this like building up, or why are people saying like this is just like a lads podcast or something yeah, like yeah. that? So I had to learn quickly. Um, but yeah, a little side segment there. How do we get there? CBDCs. <laughs> we opened the gateway. Um, but yeah, just uh, I guess we're coming towards the end. Yeah. Um, but it's been an incredible podcast. I've learned a lot. And uh, I definitely am going to follow up. But no, m- most of the time, I don't ask people about their services, right? Because I guess that's not why we're here. Mm-hmm. But when it, in this particular situation, I'm going to ask you about your services because I think, one, I might be intrigued myself, of course. Yeah. Uh, close friends of mine have used it. Um, but like, what is it that your service entails? Is it like a course or is it more so the fundamental insights? So you, not essentially you have to skip a step of learning fundamentals, but mm-hmm. are you providing those insights? Yeah, so I'll give you a, a, an overview of it. Mm-hmm. So obviously I know I've known Zane for a few years now. I taught him. Um, so what we're doing essentially is getting Zane's content. So all of his technicals, all of his reasonings, getting our, all our fundamental education. Yeah, uh, We're getting combining them together. Obviously, we've got Kara and Kareem's and his, and we got um, Zahab and his as well, because he's yeah. Wyckoff, uh, Kareem. So bring in the technical side, and then you'll bring fundamentals, fundamentals. And if people want to learn equities, US 30, and if people want to learn Wyckoff, which is, okay. I don't really use Wyckoff too much, mm-hmm. uh, but I know it's definitely sort of a, it definitely applies to sort of the fundamental aspect as well. Doing live calls. So I know a lot of people have asked saying about live trading yeah uh, so we'll be doing those live calls q a so if people like yourself you have questions and say oh i want to like why has the dollar done this or what what did the fed say or what does this mean q a's uh access to institutional traders so the guests we bring on anyway at bimond we'll just transfer it over okay. so traders at bmy melon for example we had a quant there as one of our first guests actually um he'll talk about the quant space within it in FX, because he's an FX um, quant, for the FX or markets about equities or whatever, mm. um, different guests could be FX, could be equities. Um, we've got all the research that the banks do. So we'll give you sort of all that, that research as well. We'll keep, keep you up to date with the news mm. aspects. So what's happening with the Fed this week? And we'll say, oh, here's like screenshots from Bank America or new, um, HSBC. This is what it means, blah, 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 blah all the ex- explanation. Uh, and then obviously myself and Drew, we do anyway at Bermond, we do a Tuesday breakdown. So what's kind of this, what's going to happen this week? Yeah. Little, little sort of recap of last week. And then Friday is sort of what's happened and what does that mean for the market and the explanation behind that and then kind of what's looking forward to next week. So it's bring in the technical aspect. So the lower time frame, because I know a lot of people want to do that. We'll give you the fundamentals to apply to the lower time frame. Mm-hmm. Because once you understand the fundamentals, it's you can apply it to all time frames. Yes. Um, and of course, if you want to learn the swing trading aspect, we can teach you that. If you want to learn equity markets, US 30, again, you'll learn fundamentals anyway. And all you're doing is applying what that means for US 30. Yeah. So then you'll learn about Fed, because that's really important, or China, important for equity markets. And then, of course, the Wyckoff, which is another model to get into those sort of yeah. big, big moves there. So that's it all, bringing it all together and pretty cheap actually to be honest with you like Pete we were when myself and Drew were doing like a a, um, a Zoom for Zane's community they were, they were asking for they were like oh we was like oh, by the way like how much do you think it's going to be they're like oh 2,000 pound 3,000 euros no it's not so what would you say personally based on everything one time. Uh, weekly so you can count whenever you want mm-hmm. join whenever you want weekly I've never heard of weekly actually oh, that, was, that was Zane's idea so I, I, I like I don't mind weekly either to be fair I don't it mind gives me, you the yeah. freedom, doesn't it, to yeah. join whenever you want. And it's cool. It's cool, no? Uh, weekly, weekly, weekly. All of that. So access to traders, institutional. So if you want to know how they trade, you can ask them. Mm-hmm. All the fundamental education, Zanes, all their research, all their trade ideas, all the news, 
Faraz and Zahibs. Because I know you've insinuated that it's going to be cheaper than I expect. So now I'm trying to predict cheaper. Mm. Weekly, weekly, weekly. If I was to say £50 a week? Less. 35 Less. 30 Less. 25 Less. 20 Yeah. 25, good, yeah. $25 a week. That's solid, man. That's solid. Because at the end of the day, most people will pay like, you know, maybe £100. Yeah, we didn't want it. We didn't want one. money to be the barrier to entry. Mm-hmm. So we know people charge hundreds and hundreds and hundreds a, a week or a month in, in most aspects. We didn't want it to be a barrier mm-hmm. to entry. So we think, you know what? Let's just make it as value yeah. as perspective. Are as, you going to only possible. be working as this collective or you still got your own independent running as well? Uh, no, no. So we've sort of stopped Collective. taking on BMO and just joined everything together. That's incredible. Because right? I was going to say, like, just your value alone from the, not to you know, say anything bad about <laughs> anyone else, but just from this podcast and then learning, obviously, more about the fundamentals. Um, that alone, I could see the value in. And I think I've never, as I've said, like, we've never really talked about anyone's sort of offering before. Not f- not for maybe any particular reason, but more so just because we're here to talk about the journey and, and yeah, yeah. so on. But today, you know, after learning about the fundamental side, I think it'll be highly, you know, whether it's with you or just anyone mm-hmm. in terms of fundamentals, obviously make sure you hear their content, for example. But yeah, no, really, really insightful. I really Thank enjoyed it. it. One question I do have to you, or a couple before we just wrap up there, is uh, one thing that came up, I don't know if it was recently, it was like maybe about six months ago, was, you know, as we were going into the whole... Uh, Russia Ukraine war a bit, yeah. when we were getting into a into that a bit um was in regards to like the petrodollar and like uh you know certain nations okay. coming together to stop paying for oil in in the US dollar why is that important or why is that a conversation that is a, has a reoccurring theme to it the you got to think economies go through or regime regime shifts so for example like before the US was like the powerhouse mm-hmm. it was the UK wasn't it um and then before that, I can't remember who who was before that actually. Now people are are trying to knock them off the high horse mm-hmm. and and try and bring forth the bricks. Obviously, it's Brazil, Russia, India, uh, China, China, yeah. Uh, and S aren't they bringing Saudi Arabia on at some point? I think they were yeah, trying to. From what I was seeing, yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah, they're all they're doing is just trying to knock the US off the high horse because they're kind of like the power. Everything's done in dollars, so yeah. they obviously benefit the most. They're just trying to bring forth sort of a fight against the US Mm -hmm. it's going to take it will eventually happen because a lot of like looking back in history many centuries and centuries and centuries economies rise and fall Rome for example rose and then collapsed Mm -hmm. UK you know during during sort of the the British Empire and then it sort of collapsed right so it will eventually happen to the US history states it will so from a historical perspective it makes sense it will take decades though because the markets are not just going to change from the US to this new currency, mm-hmm. they've got to go for a huge regime shift of, oh, now oil, okay, oil, that's not really going to do much, and then I have to do the financial markets. And then that needs to bring trust. So remember, trust is important for investors mm-hmm. because in times of unrest, are they going to go to Brazil? Are they going to go to Russia? Yeah, These are the questions you have to ask, right? Eventually it will change, uh, but it's in times of unrest, times of worry, they're going to go to the US anyway. And then eventually, maybe when politically it makes more sense, mm-hmm. that's when it will probably sort of start to to pick up. Because it's all just about trust at the moment. Definitely. No, that makes sense. And uh, it would be interesting, wouldn't it? Like, why Brazil? I would never have thought of having Brazil in there, you know? Especially with like Russia, India, China. Damn, yes. Um, of, uh, and Saudi Arabia. Interesting well, addition. <laughs> they, managed, they managed to do something. Uh, you know, they South Africa, any... wasn't it? South Africa was the last one. Is it South Africa? South Africa, yeah. Ah. Sorry, yeah. But, they need to get Saudi but I believe Arabia, Saudi Arabia and sort of the Middle East was in talks, wasn't there? Yes, yeah. I remember there was. I think there was like a convention or something or some sort of meeting that took place. Um, so yeah, I see the articles. My job is that I should Let's read more into it. Forget, it. like it's just not worth. Like it's going to take ages before that happens. Have you heard anything since then? I'll pass the knowledge on to. My, I'll, I'll pass <laughs> the article to my child. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like yeah, I haven't heard anything since last year about it. No, I haven't. Yeah, like, no, you're 100% very, very right. long time. So it's a it's a conversation that like pops up every I don't know like few years or decade, right? Um, normally around unrest, it's mm-hmm. like a class. It's like a chess move, I guess. You know, in terms of like, oh, this player is weak. Yeah, we need to I form agree. to form together and take them out, and uh, that doesn't seem to work just yet. <laughs> um, but I guess that's you know what you were alluding to as though is 
the theme of uh, Ray Dalio's book, right? The was it the falling of empires or the changing of new world orders, something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, I haven't read it yet. I think I have it, but I haven't read it, which is a classic theme. Our principles have. as well, Ray Dalio by Ray Dalio. Yes, yes, yes. Um, yeah. So off the back of this podcast, we've learned I need to read more. I need to get into fundamentals. <laughs> yeah, don't get me wrong. I wasn't good. I, and I, I watched The Crown. That's yeah. what we've all. I'll, I'll, I'll start. I'll start. <laughs> Oh man, this has been fun, man. And uh, for people who don't know, actually, me and Mark, we filmed an episode what? six months ago. Yeah, like mid last year, wasn't it? Yeah, Somewhere yeah. Like. And uh, unfortunately, when we came round to posting it now, uh, well, I say fortunately, actually, because I feel like this one was much better mm-hmm. in terms of the amount of value we got out to you. Um, though I can't remember everything from the last <laughs> one because it was that long ago. So apologies to you, but no I'm no so worries. thankful that we got to do this. Um, I'm going to ask one last thing of you, though, which is... You look down this lens here and you sure. give them like a minute tops, just under a minute of like your biggest motivation, um, your value push to just tell traders what they need to do to become profitable or get out of the rut that they're in right now of not being profitable or seeing the progress they want to see. Whether it's fundamentally driven, whether it's technical, whether it's just mindset, whatever okay. you want to go. Yeah. Delivery, this is your moment to be, you have your Rocky Balboa moment. You know? <laughs> uh, I'd say it's a marathon, not a sprint. You know, just because you're losing now doesn't mean you're going to be losing forever. Learn fundamentals. That drives currencies. That drives price. So if you understand the reason why something is happening, you can understand why you might be taking those losses. Uh, why is it going to rally this high? So it's a marathon, not a sprint. Learn fundamentals. It will take time. It will take patience, but most importantly is experience as well, which obviously comes with time. So the more experience you get, the more you make at the end of the day. So yeah, that's what I'd say. Love that. Love that. Well, Mark, thank you so much for coming down once again. Hopefully we'll do something again in the future, I hope. And I'm going to be coming to you for some wisdom in terms (laughs) of my fundamentals. Everyone at home, make sure you drop a comment below with your biggest takeaway. There was a lot to learn from this one. And I hope you had your notepads. And if not, go back and watch it again. Um, and let us know your biggest takeaway from this episode. You know The links for Mark and uh, his projects will be in the description below. So check those out as well. Hit like, hit subscribe, and check out the you know other episodes, the playlists that will be up on screen, no doubt. And uh, until next time, take care.